welcome you all back to Human Humane Architecture here from exotic Honolulu, Hawaii. And exotic is, a, is an external perception by, by nature. And so if we could get picture one, um, and we take a critical position here. And so um, we have to say that after we got contacted here or annexed or multiple other terms one yes. can use. Yes. Um, you would assume that to this most beautiful place on earth, for sure in the United States, you would only bring the best things. But my very provocative manifesto here and today is that is sort of decreasingly the way. Yeah, this is potentially true. There, it is. there, there, there are always costs involved. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. So to discuss that and having some specific case studies as food for thought, we bring in our favorite guest, and I should say a co-host. Yes, thank DeSoto, you. DeSoto. How do you do? Who is uh, our world-famous expert in exoticism. Well, I won't say world famous, but I'm the best but, you got right now. But I did. Yeah. yeah. All right. All right. So, okay. Uh, okay. So we will start once again. So we look the, the the pedagogy is we look back to see what we have done better than we're currently doing it to right. learn from that and doing it better again in the future. So let's right. go back to where it started, and this is actually reconnecting. Our last show was focusing on the darkest era, which was the war. Right. And now we're looking at the uplifting era right after the and war. the post-war period, mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, what we're going to talk about today is a man, two different men, Henry J. Kaiser and Buckminster Fuller. And those two men both had an impact, and they, they got together in different interesting ways as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. So let's look at our first, our, our first picture here, which is about Henry J. Kaiser. And he was an industrialist, uh, American success story. During World War II, he had already become a very important man and was very was very powerful industrially. Tycoon, but, right? Yeah, he was a tycoon, but he built ships for the war effort during World War II at an astoundingly fast pace. Mm -hmm. And that really fast pace was something he continued to carry mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. So this is a comic book that shows shipbuilder number one, Henry J. Kaiser. Mm -hmm. And of course, he did a lot of different mm -hmm. types of industrial things. And he did all that to clarify on the mainland, maybe. Correct, right? correct. And so this is a certain point. Exactly. So so let's go to our next picture. Uh, Henry J. Kaiser was uh, fascinated by, he, he was an industrialist, mm -hmm. and he wanted to build machines, and one of the things that he liked was cars. And of course, in the 20th century, the car industry was huge. Mm -hmm. And so he got into different types of car manufacturing, and we're going to talk about that when we do our next show on Henry J. Kaiser. But he did, in the 1950s, after he had moved here, he came up with aluminum car designs, because he was, one of his companies was Kaiser Aluminum. Oh, so he's crazy. And these crazy 50s cars. Let's go to the next one. And as you can see, they've got Maybe Hawaiian so. names. So there's the Pele, the Menahune, and the Waimea. This is because he was living here at the time. So he was doing this Hawaiian cultural thing. And as you can see in the bottom corner there, there's a little picture that says Kaiser Aluminum with the Kaiser Aluminum logo for the very peculiar all aluminum Waimea car that doesn't look like it was all that uh, reasonable to actually use in the real world, mm -hmm. but okay, it's a concept and, and car. And these all stayed concept cars Correct. versus some other cars that he built, and we're going to get to that later. We will talk about that. There was as little keynotes. It's Correct. Kaiser Fraser. It's right. actually Willie's Kaiser, mm -hmm. and, and lots more to come. Right, so, so there were too. real Kaiser cars in mm -hmm. addition to these mm -hmm. fantasy cars we mm -hmm. saw. But these got never built. Correct. And that gets us to the next important figure in history. He also did a lot of crazy stuff. It's Buckminster Fuller, and there's Buckminster Fuller, and you can see that on this picture, of, this picture of him on the cover of Time magazine, his head has been turned into a dome because he was famous for creating and inventing the dome. And if you look in the lower corner of that picture too, in the right, uh, there's a little red car, mm -hmm. and that was one of the things that he invented. And in fact, that was the Dymaxion car. And if we go to our next picture. There is the Dymaxion mm -hmm. car, mm -hmm. uh, constructed, I believe, 1934. And this is at a time period in which streamlining was the big thing. Every machine that had to move through air, you wanted to make it smooth so it would move faster. Mm -hmm. Well, the Dymaxion car is kind of this teardrop that just would cut through the air. Mm -hmm. And they built at least one of them. Uh, but I think that's as far as it went. Or maybe there were 
I think there was more than one. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, it never went into production. And, and this fascination, by the way, continues as one of the most prominent architects from my discipline in the world, Lord Norman Foster. Mm -hmm. And he is such a fan of Bucky and credits him for an inspiration for his own work. So he took on on his own as a private person to build a, a rebuild or an interpretation of the Dymaxion car. Really? My very best German friend uh, and, and colleague Stefan Kleinschmidt, I, Stefan, is highly, you know, a fan and enthused by this era. So this is continued. Correct. This is not just Correct. old stuff that's Correct. dusty. Correct. This is still, if you Google for this stuff online, there's like tons. Really? Right? So fascination to be continued. Well, okay, the thing about the Dymaxion car was the exterior was, of course, as you can see, as smooth and slippery as possible. Mm -hmm. And the inside, they tried to make it as comfortable and homey as possible. So one of the things they wanted to do was to get away from standard seat arrangement, and they, make, they wanted to make it so it was kind of like a little room, mm -hmm. so that you could rearrange furniture in a little room, mm -hmm. which unfortunately does not work in the real world yeah, if yeah. you come to a sudden stop and all your furniture is yeah, forward. Yeah. And, and all his inventions, so he was an inventor, uh, an engineer, an architect, kind of like a Michelangelo scope guy. And all these things are also highly, um, they're ahead of their time in many ways. I mean, this is a seven-seater passenger car, so moving people. You know, carpooling, the big thing here on H1, I, I always get appalled, it's like a minimum of two, that's all it takes to be called a carpool. I mean, this is a joke from my European yeah, no, point no, of no, view. You're right, you're right, you're right. Uh, you talked about Streamline. Streamline has a very functional uh, reasoning, can yes. have, before it got fetishized, as we correct, talked. Correct. And, and this is uh, energy efficient. Right. This was a very, very energy efficient car. So it actually had everything. That's what we call ahead of its time, and that's ironically why sometimes in our modern times things don't fly, right? right. And Henry J. Kaiser, as we know, mm -hmm. got one of the Dymaxion cars. Mm -hmm. He put a different engine in it because he wanted it to go faster. Mm -hmm. He got in it, tried to drive it, and flipped it over. Well, I only know this through you, so thanks for teaching Okay, no, me. no, but this but is this an is... an awesome connection, which yeah, I didn't. I mean, this yeah. is what the show is for. Correct. Right? So the Dymaxion car didn't go anywhere, but something else at Buckminster Fuller designed was... The house. The, the Dymaxion house. house. And there's the interior of one of the Dymaxion houses. Tell us about the, the house. You know more than I do. Because I'm the architect. You're the architect. You, there tell, we us. Go. you tell us. So, uh... It was not that unsimilar to the car, and, and this is the interior. So a very wide open space. This has a central mast, then basically suspended uh, pylons and, and, and cables. So you have a sort of uh, a free-flowing room, and it's, it's organized in this sort of very free flow. You see this panoramic window, yeah. very sort of romantic, the American landscape yes. in, in the background. So this was like sort of the the innovation of the little house on the prairie. You know, right. in, in modern uh, machine age, pre-manufactured, pre right. everything aluminum. If we go to the next picture, this is a, a great, uh, compelling Exxon uh, diagram that shows all the whistles and bells and all the features. So everything we talk about today, off the grid, uh, harvesting its own energy, uh, naturally ventilated, resilience. So this is basically the, ne the next picture is going to be um, the prototype never got built, but then he tried one more time and this one was built and it was sort of dumbed down and value engineered, that's kind of dirty term. Yeah. And this is called the Wichita house because it was built in Wichita. In Wichita they have tornadoes. Right. So this house has like the plan has a root. So there's a safe room in the basement. Once again, too good to be true, and America was, the world was not ready for the thing, and he just never built any of it. No, and the other thing, too, is that there was also a, a fad or a fascination at the time with prefabrication, mm -hmm. because it was the idea was if you can build components in factories and then send them to the location, mm -hmm. it will cut out all these extra expenses of building houses and building other buildings and so forth. So the Dymaxion house was supposed to be a prefab unit, if mm -hmm. I remember mm -hmm. correctly, mm -hmm. and in its initial form in 1928, it was going to be airlifted to its location by a Zeppelin mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. this is because you know it, it lifts things up and mm -hmm, takes them mm -hmm. around this is again fantasy yeah, yeah. world and then it would be put down on the pylon which would be there and then you would just put it on it and there's your house mm -hmm. and then and you drive to it and from it in your Dymaxion car and, and maybe you know it sounds so accusational to say you know the public just didn't want it they weren't smart enough stuff like that but maybe that's the nature of innovation 
just being ahead, it reminds me of my, uh, my uh, oldest son who was just here visiting and is his Master's of Automotive Engineering and Management. Hi, Joey, hang in there. Um, he entered with Audi, and Audi has put out what's, a gen I think, a brilliant car and has never made it to the United States. It's the A2, and it's from the early 90s. And it's a whole aluminum car, so it could be in the tradition of, of Kaiser. And, and, and Audi put, and if you, if you like the, what's it called, that, where they track um, how much your, how often your car breaks down and stuff like that. Yeah, There's okay, yeah, 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 that. right, right. Has the best ratings, even though it's like old car, but it was made to last, yeah. highly innovative, and they, they put so much research funding and resources in there that they never got it out of the car, but they used it for, for future projects, Correct. right? And that's the nature of, uh, of research and development, R&D. Now, right? one thing that, one thing that has happened, however, though, with prefabrication is that it turns out frequently that prefabbing doesn't end up saving money. Mm -hmm. And that was what it comes down mm -hmm, to. Mm -hmm. And there were other houses that uh, in the 1950s, in the post-war period, there was the Lustron oh, yeah. all-metal house. Mm -hmm. Again, sort of a similar thing, but much more of a traditional, normal-looking yeah. house by what we would standardize also, like, it Also, like, related a little bit, you know, exactly. which we talked about before. Um, and it ended up not saving money. Yeah. Uh, there was also Alcoa, which was a competitor of Kaiser Aluminum mm -hmm. Company, created in the 50s something called the Alcoa Carefree Home, mm -hmm. and they got people to build copies of it in different cities in the U.S. and then sold those. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, they turned out to be far more expensive than the average middle class yeah, person yeah, yeah. could afford. So, yeah. And the Alcoa house was a little, a lot of stuff to say, less innovative than oh, uh, not very the innovative. Dimension house. No, no. But ironically, or maybe that's the way how dumbed down capitalism works, Al uh, Alcoa is still around. Yeah. And, and Kaiser, at least in, in this way, we should basically, by the way, mention to people who are not from the island that most people these days know Kaiser through his health insurance. Exactly. And one of the many innovations. Exactly. And Kaiser. Culture. And that's something we will get to when we do another show about Henry J. Kaiser. The reason we're talking about him here is because he ended up at the end of his life, after all these other ad ad business adventures, mm -hmm. settling here. Mm -hmm. Came here in the middle 1950s and transplanted all of that mm -hmm. energy mm -hmm. to here. Mm -hmm. So he did a bunch of stuff here, as I mentioned earlier. That's yeah, why yeah. we have the Pele car. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to talk about that in another time. But mm -hmm. again, for any industry and for any type of... Uh, business, you want to build your business. Yeah, and so yeah. you want to tell people, hey, look at all these innovative things we're making that mm -hmm. you want to go mm -hmm. out and buy. Mm -hmm. And if it's aluminum foil, you know, that is something that was successful yeah, for yeah. aluminum to sell. Yeah, but yeah. the all aluminum cars and mm -hmm. the Dymaxian house, not so and, much. And talking financial success, there was one thing that actually Fuller became economically, financially successful. That's, we want to go to the next picture. Okay, well, let's go to our next picture and, and see there's Buckminster Fuller with a ex shining example of one of his domes. You want to take your head off now? Uh, no, we're not, we're not at oh, that we're point not ready yet. yet. Well, okay, okay. We're talking we're talk about domes. Look, everybody, we got three domes. Here's one dome, there's another dome, and behind us if you is haven't, a Buckminster Fuller dome. If you dome. haven't recognized this, is the joke of the day. It's the joke uh, of the day. Uh -huh. Wah, wah, wah. Okay, anyway, back to Buckminster Fuller. Um, this is probably his most famous dome, I would say. It was the American Pavilion at the uh, Montreal World's Fair, which was called Expo 67. Mm -hmm. And it was where America showed off to the world, mm -hmm. various things like the American movie industry mm -hmm. and uh, other things like that within this dome. And unfortunately, it burned down. Mm -hmm. uh, the plastic exterior burned at one point, but I'm not sure if it still is, mm -hmm. is, is in existence or not. And this shocking moment we take to exactly. this initiation to take a little break of one minute. That's and right. And back. we'll be back with more dome activities mm -hmm. right after this. Aloha, my name is Carl Campagna and I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Education Movers, Shakers and Reformers. I invite you to come watch our show on thinktechhawaii.com. You can also see our shows on YouTube as well if you can Google search those. I appreciate the time. I hope that you do join us as we learn about education, about the educational system here in Hawaii, what the challenges are, what the benefits are and how much our kids are learning. So thank you. I hope you join us. Hello, I'm Marianne Sasaki. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii, where some of the most interesting conversations in Honolulu go on. 
I have a show on Wednesdays from 1 to 2 called Life in the Law, where we discuss legal issues, politics, governmental topics, and a whole host of issues. I hope you'll join me. Hey, has your signal just been taken over, or am I supposed to be here? This is Andrew, the security guy, your co-host on Hibachi Talk. Please join us every Friday on Think Tech Hawaii. Welcome back to uh, Kaiser's Avant-Garde Exotic Hawaii with Mr. Exotic DeSoto Brown. So next picture, number 15, again, he was thinking big. Mm -hmm. So the dome wasn't necessarily, uh, you know, concrete application. There was a bigger vision about it. Too. Yes. I mean, this one yes. was about covering an entire part of Manhattan. Yeah, and there were other kooky ideas like this at the time of, um, Controlling environment, in other words, building a, a huge dome that covered mm -hmm. not just an individual house, mm -hmm. but a whole city. Mm -hmm. And then you had a whole climate controlled interior and you probably could you know, protect against yeah. atomic blasts yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and things like that, based on 50s activities yeah. or thinking. But the so, one built yeah. was the one in 67, and there's another picture, uh, number 16. And there. there's there's and, there's a dome. There's and the once dome. again, always making promotion for my own previous shows, there's one from the old Urban Transcendence days that I was shooting in, uh, in the outskirts of Dresden with my dear mm -hmm. mentor, Larry Medlin. Hi, Larry who actually was a personal friend of Conrad Waxman talking about prefabrication, but it was also part of uh, uh, the team for the 67 Pavilion. Oh, okay. So he's okay. another eyewitness as you were. Exactly. Please I, share, don't hide. I got to go inside that, uh, that Buckminster Fuller Dome at Expo 67, and I got to go into the Kaiser Aluminum Dome, which is right behind me here that so I'm touching. So there's no way. So we had one in Honolulu. So we had a dome in Honolulu, and in fact, that's the juxtaposition of Buckminster Fuller and Henry J. Kaiser because in 1957, this kooky dome was built at the Hawaiian Village Hotel, which was started by Henry J. Kaiser several years earlier. Mm -hmm. And it was in Waikiki. The dome used to be located right at the intersection of Kalia Road and Ala Moana. Mm -hmm. And it used to be visible up until the 1990s. It's not there anymore. But in keeping with what we've just been discussing, what, the, the dome was created, one, as a promotion for Kaiser Aluminum, mm -hmm. as a modern building material, mm -hmm. as we've just been discussing. You want to build mm -hmm. interest in your product. And two, it was a way to get um, attention for building something that was prefab mm -hmm. and that they could advertise, look, we can mm -hmm. build this mm -hmm. in just a matter of hours. And you so, tell your anecdote about so that. In our and next, the next picture is illustrating that. Um, is that and when we categorize the dome, which everyone knows by now, I like to do everything that comes. I test if it is uh, not from here; it's imported, but then it could be invasive or it could be exotic. Yeah, exactly. And uh, we started talking and saying the dome might look invasive because it's you know not an organic material; it's aluminum; it's shipped in. But if we look closer, we both got closer to the point to say maybe it's exotic for, for some reasons we will talk about. And one is, is that picture number 17, that nature is the best uh, uh, solar generator, the best solar plant, mm -hmm. and it can sort of duplicate itself and grow. And so the dome did. The dome was prefabricated in Oakland, California, where at Kaiser's plant. Right. And then it was shipped over here and put together. And Kaiser, of course, as being the client, wanted to see it coming up. He did not. He missed the entire construction because he missed his plane. And the dome took only 22 hours to go up. I mean, right. that's innovation, right? Right. I mean, and look so at the towers here, all the buildings. They take a year. They do. Two years. Oh, yes, of course. This so took they took not even a day. So it's kind of like less. it's kind of like the Dymaxion we were we're talking about because it was a central mast yeah. and then the pieces were assembled around it and gradually sort of mm -hmm. winched up to where it got up to its proper height. Absolutely. And of course they had already built a cement slab for it yeah. to rest upon. Yeah. Yeah. And then as you said, you bolt them together, you mm -hmm. lift them up mm -hmm. and you got a yeah. building. And another criteria check for exotic, if we bring up number 18 now, 
the dome was certainly sort of a reflective, you know, surface, so it was probably radiating and, you know, heat, its mitigational capacities wasn't the greatest, but different to the other arenas built, like the Stan Sheriff or the Blazer, which is a good building, so don't get me wrong, guys, but they're all enclosed, they're hermetic, they're AC. This is an easy breezy dome, mm -hmm. right? So the right. ground floor was open for Correct. the breeze. And, and it, it, it was a little bit weird because having gone into it, mm -hmm. the, the bottom of the dome was was jagged. Mm -hmm. It was a yeah. zigzaggy yeah, yeah. bottom. Well, it came and out of the nature, the genetic of, nature of, those, of, the of those things. Mm -hmm. But uh, at the same time, that strange open space at the bottom, while it did let in bugs and it did let in rain and wind mm -hmm. uh, and noise, at the same time, it kept things mm -hmm. naturally mm -hmm. air-conditioned, if you will, because this is in a location <clears throat> where the trade winds are blowing most of the time. So it's not <clears throat> as you don't have to heat it, mm -hmm. you don't have to cool it, mm -hmm. it can sort of do those things on yeah, its own. Yeah, yeah, So more and more, it gets more and more exotic. Right. And if we go to the next picture, it also had a property, I'm also teaching systems in, 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 in school, so we go through the different systems. One of the systems has to do with the ear. Right. So what was one of the performance criteria well, that was superb? It, it had good acoustics, and that was something that was unsure before mm -hmm, it was mm -hmm. open. There were people saying it's such a loud, you know, metal surface, is yeah, that really going to yeah. work? Well, it was used for many years as a performance venue for a lot of different things. Um, it was used initially for different individual uh, events, mm -hmm. but it also then eventually got used as a staging venue for regular shows. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, Don Ho mm -hmm. appeared in the Dome for many years. Mm -hmm. um, but it also is, we're talking about this as spacey exotica. Mm -hmm. so. The spaciness of this is clearly evident. It's yeah. a modern space yeah. age, funny looking building mm -hmm. like the Jetsons would live in. Mm -hmm. But it also was, the Hawaiian Village Hotel was the venue <laughs> at which a uh, type of music was invented and first performed, which is now called Exotica. Mm -hmm. And it was, the next picture. and so yes, and so here's Hawaii A Go Go. Yeah, <laughs> that's my, f you know, you have no idea how appropriate Hawaii Goes A Go Go is to me. But in any we case. We do a show about it, then we have a better Okay, idea. Mm -hmm. well in any case, this is a record by Martin Denny, and Martin Denny was the leader of a group that perfected and first performed what was called Exotica. And that was a melding of traditional indigenous instruments from many different cultures with American jazz. Mm -hmm. And it was tremendously successful and it was originated at the Hawaiian Village Hotel. They performed inside that dome. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they were on TV, they released many different mm -hmm. records. The group split up fairly soon afterwards and Arthur Lyman, who had been one of the members, uh, went off and became a percussionist on his mm -hmm. own. And there but, was Dennis Baxter as and, the third one. Right? So these, there were these three mm -hmm. people who were who were crucial in that. And Augie Colon was also one of the original yeah. members too. So, but in any case, they performed inside the dome. So you had, yeah. again, um, Exotica, which is a melding of Eastern and Western, different cultures, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. using traditional older stuff, but put together in a modern space age, 1950s way. Yeah. And the dome was a perfect venue for that. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And Hawaii goes out, go, go, I'll there, tell you. There you go. And, there she and, you, is. and you told me actually the dome was actually, it's also a bioclimatic um, uh, smartness. Uh, they weren't using it when it was the hottest during the day that much. They were basically evening it when. Correct. Correct. And when you said the acoustics were good or so, I think some people online that I found when I was Googling, they would argue with you and say it was, it was Perfect. It was the best. I mean, there's an enthusiasm ongoing, right. which we talked about Correct. today. Correct. There's a whole community out there who dig out the old vinyls, which you have some, mm -hmm. and and basically said, look at the crispness of the acoustics. Yeah. You can't you can't beat that. Yeah. So once well, again, I mean, this was a this was like uh, you know um, the best was almost not good enough for Hawaii. So Kaiser was so stunned by this island that he like left all his other yes. stuff behind and basically this is where I want to be correct and if I'm here I certainly want to bring only the best of the best in any ways and that's absolutely true mm -hmm. and and he had the money and he had the power and he had the drive to get mm -hmm. these things mm -hmm. done mm -hmm. so these things happen really fast yeah, yeah. Um, the dome is no longer with us unfortunately okay let's uh, take out the tissues go to the next the next picture here. here's what 
it got replaced by was the Kalia Tower. And that had the misfortune of opening right before September 11th, 2001, when tourism took a terrible dive. And it also had the terrible misfortune of, unlike the dome that it replaced, being an entirely hermetically sealed system. And this led to mold growth. And the entire building had to be shut down all the new, I mean, and again, this is a new building with new furnishings, all the furnishings, all the carpeting, all the curtains, everything had to be stripped out, destroyed, and they had to start again from scratch after and, disinfecting it. And we pulled this from the web, so this is basically the, the lawyers or whoever who were listing and diagramming all the all the dysfunctionalities. So it's oh. ironic, as you said, there is the most exotic piece on the island mm -hmm. probably has uh, been replaced by the most invasive. Correct. I mean, how, how can this be? And I, I like to run out of time and then not getting to the last, so I want to say this now, and this is sort of, once again, sort of a self-promotion. Number 23 is us, uh, currently my um, uh, emerging architectural generations. Yeah. My mentees are currently working on this project here, which we had started last semester. Uh, which just um, doesn't want to agree that we can't be innovative anymore because Hawaii is still the most awesome and beautiful place. So nothing has changed except we have changed and we should reconnect to these roots. And that's why history is not a dead animal, not a dead body. It's a very alive organism that we can pull from and, and, and analyze and, and reference and be critical about what hasn't worked or what has worked. And the, the name we give this building here is the last picture here. This is a tribute to Martin, Martin Denny. Denny. The exotic sounds of Martin Denny. Again, uh, a mixture of the primitive, the modern, mm -hmm. and the natural and the man-made all melded together in a mm -hmm. wonderful time period that you were just saying was an optimistic time period, a time of technological innovation, and yeah. a time when people had faith that technology was not going to destroy us, but in fact was going to save mm -hmm. us, and that was a different yeah. than yeah. what we think now. And in tribute to that, we call this project, which tries to be a proletarian people power tower, because we have, we have to say we have different issues than entertainment works out That's great right. on the island, right. but how we all, other people who live here, the locals, yes. and especially the ones on the lower end of the food chain can survive that's the big issue so we we're dedicating the project to that we're getting close to the end of the show only to advertise the next show because the next show will show uh, sort of the other side or oh. another side of Kaiser oh, Henry J. Very Kaiser briefly say uh, which one that is as an advertiser well it's more it's more the everyday Henry Kaiser it's not the exotica spacey one but it's sort of the down-to-earth Henry J. Kaiser as the industrialist and the man who is a successful builder and a successful developer and as you mentioned earlier uh, was so diverse that he even created the Kaiser health plan all right so we will call that Kaiser Kaiser's Mainstream Exotic Kaiser Hawaii. Mainstream Exotic Hawaii. And we look forward to that. Thank you so much for You're having me You're very welcome. Here. Thanks.